All right, so a feature that we do get to get to in class about ordinary differential equations is how ordinary differential equations are connected to partial differential equations. When you look at how ordinary differential equations are connected to partial differential equations, you find out that there are generally um, ordinary differential equations can be found inside partial differential equations. Okay. However, for partial differential equations, you're typically looking at the dynamics of some space-time structure, maybe, maybe the dynamics of this table as it vibrates, because I'm touching it, right, that has multiple dimensions of space, and because it's undergoing oscillations, it has um, a definite time feature to it as well. So, the reason why we don't typically study this in uh, an ordinary differential equations class is that it gets somewhat complicated um, because I guess the easiest way to say this is that where two by two linear problems or second order problems were found to have two um, solutions to them, Right, meaning that the solution space is somehow two-dimensional. The solution space to a partial differential equation is um, generally infinite dimensional. We'll see what that means here in a second, but maybe we should just start off by saying that one of the main focuses that we want to get to this last bit of material is on vibrations. Um, for the ideal um, oscillations of a one-dimensional continuum say an elastic string which is much longer Then its width we have the wave equation. This wave equation is a partial differential equation, so it is an equation that looks like the second partial of this unknown function u with respect to time is equal to c squared times the second partial of u with respect to x. Right, x is going to be some variable between 0 and L, inclusive. And actually, let's just have that be an open boundary, and then time is going to go from 0 to infinity. Okay. So this can be derived by analyzing the tensile forces on um, an ideally elastic string. It could also be derived through energy considerations, but here we'll just take it as equation one and we'll take it as a given. So what's important to remember is that u, the unknown function, is a function of both space and time, and it represents the displacements of the string from rest. So, what we could do here is maybe idea Suppose you had some sort of system, which is u is a function of x, right? And then you have, this is length l, which is the length of your string. And suppose that you wanted to fix the boundaries, right? So that the string is always touching those two points. What that would tell me is that u of 0 comma t is always 0, and that u of L comma T is always zero. These are what are known as boundary conditions. Those boundary conditions are going to say that the displacement at the edge of the, the string's boundary are going to be fixed. You could think about this as being like a guitar string or something like that. 
um, so that the uh, edge is right here fixed. Now we can think to put a displacement on that guitar string, maybe something like this. Right? I use triangles here just because of examples that are typically done. I mean, you wouldn't take a triangle and create a cusp point like that, but you could set this up just for this thought process where that's L over 2. And now what you're going to want to look at is what this equation here is trying to tell you about the time dynamics of this red displacement curve is, is, is governed by this equation right here. So what we can see here is that in this region where the triangle is pointing upward, the, the shape of the curve is generally concave up. And if it's concave up, then what that means to me is that in this region right here, um, the second derivative of u with respect to space is a positive quantity. Let me just restate all of that in the correct way, and that is that this is concave down, and so that this second derivative is a negative quantity, right? If the second derivative is a negative quantity, then that means that the second partial of u with respect to t is also a negative quantity, right? Because this second partial of u with respect to space is negative. c squared is a positive number, so a negative times a positive is again a negative, so this second partial is negative. What this means to me is that for all points um, between um, x equals 0 and x equal L over 2, um, the u function, which is telling me displacements, has a negative acceleration. So that means that there is an acceleration down. Right. That means that this triangle is going to want to be forced down, and eventually it will become forced down, much like mass spring systems, right? Only for all the points on this triangle. And then it'll go down. And as this goes down, well, what are the accelerations here? The accelerations are pointing upward because this is concave up, and so it's going to go up, right? And so in some future state, right, this triangle is going to be pointed down, and then this triangle is going to be pointed up, and they'll keep oscillating down and up, down and up, up and down, up and down, with reverse polarity of one another. And so that's just the basic idea. So you might ask the question, what does this have to do with ordinary differential equations? To see the connection to ordinary differential equations, the first step is called separation of variables, separation of variables for partial differential equations. And the whole idea is that u of x comma t is equal to f of x times g of t. Why would you want to do that? Well, the idea here is that you're expecting the spatial shape represented by f of x to somehow decouple from its temporal dynamics. So this specifies here a shape. And this specifies the dynamics. I mean, there's no reason that this has to be right, but as you might notice from our differential equations class, right, we make guesses and we hope for the best. In particular, why would you make this guess? Well, if I would look at the partial of u with respect to time, right, well, that partial of u with respect to time when the time derivative hits, the f function won't feel anything, but the g function will feel a time derivative, so it's just an f, and then a g function with a time derivative, which we'll represent with a dot, similar to how Newton would do it. Right. At the end of the day, what this tells me is that um, u sub x, x, the second partial with respect to space, looks like two derivatives on the f function and no derivatives on the g, and u sub t, t is going to look like no derivatives on the f function and two time derivatives on the g function. So then if I multiply this equation through by c squared and set them equal to one another, all right, as equation 1 would have us do, then we get the equation that f times g double prime is equal to c squared times f 
double prime g. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is that if f and g are not zero, then the implication is that I get g double prime, or g dot dot for time derivatives over c squared times g is equal to f double prime over f by dividing the whole equation through by both g and f. Now what we want to remember here is that this equation is an equation on time. Well, this equation here is an equation on space. The two equations must be equal no matter the time value or the location in space. What this means for our equation is that I'm going to set them equal to a function that does not depend on time or space. I'm going to set them equal to negative lambda, where lambda is some sort of constant. The idea here is that if you were to fiddle with time, right, say this had a t multiplier. Let's just erase this really quick. Say it has a t multiplier. As I fiddle with time, these two um, components change while well, this stays the same, because there's no time dependence on the f equation. So the equality could not possibly ma be maintained as I fiddle with time. Right? The same thing would be true if I put an x here for t. Right? If I fiddle with the x, then these two components would change, and this time equation would stay the same. Right? And the equality couldn't be true as those things were being fiddled with. So the argument is, is if this side depends on time and this side depends on space, they must be equal to a function that does not depend on time or space, which is just a constant function. Okay. So what we get here is an equation g dot dot plus c squared um, times lambda g is equal to zero and f double prime plus lambda f is equal to zero. We get to these two equations by treating, okay, to get to the f equation, we cover this time equation up, we multiply the f over to the right-hand side and carry it on over to the left, that gives us this equation. Or, covering this part up, which we'll do this way, I multiply c squared g over to the right and then bring everything over here. Now this lambda, this lambda could still be anything, and this is called the separation constant. But the point here is that instead of one partial differential equation to solve, Um, so one PDE is traded for two infinite sets of ODE. What do I mean by the two infinite sets? There's one, there's two. Why infinite? Well, this lambda could depend on anything, right? But the, the nice thing is, is both equations that we're looking at are harmonic oscillator equations. So they're both of simple harmonic oscillator type, which means that we know how to solve both of them. So looking back on what we've done, what we want to have happen here is, okay, so to speak more about this, remember that this equation is an equation on the dynamics, while this equation here is an equation on the shape. So the to-do item that we have is 1, figure out the dynamics, 
And for the dynamics, what would we probably demand? We'd demand the oscillation. And then once we have the dynamics, then we can figure out the shape. Okay. That concludes step one. The next step then would be step two, which is to solve these equations to figure out the shape and the dynamics that are being um, demanded by this partial differential equation right here.